Our liver cells and skeletal muscle cells are responsible for glycogen breakdown. And what that basically means is they have to be able to regulate the process of the breakdown of glycogen. Now, how exactly do these two different types of cells regulate glycogen breakdown? Well, one point of regulation is the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. And remember, as we discussed in the previous lecture, this is the enzyme that is responsible for actually catalyzing step one of glycogen breakdown. So glycogen phosphorylase basically cleaves the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond and releases a glucose 1-phosphate from the glycogen polymer molecule. Now, because skeleton muscle cells and liver cells have slightly different functions in terms of what they actually do with the glucose once they release the glucose from glycogen, they also regulate glycogen phosphorylase in slightly different ways. So in this lecture, I'd like to focus on how the skeleton muscle cells actually regulate glycogen phosphorylase. In the next lecture, we're going to focus on liver cells and discuss how they regulate glycogen breakdown via the regulation of glycogen phosphorylase. Now, glycogen phosphorylase is actually a dimer molecule. It consists of two polypeptide subunits and it is an allosteric enzyme. What that means is there exist certain types of molecules inside our cells that can actually either inhibit or activate the activity of glycogen phosphorylase. Now, within skeleton muscle cells, phosphorylase exists in two interconvertible forms. We have phosphorylase A and we have phosphorylase B. Now, each one of these phosphorylase enzymes in turn exist in two different states. We have the T state, known as the 10 state, and we have the R state, also known as the relaxed state. Now, what's the difference between the T state and the R state? Well, in the T state, as a result of the conformation of the dimer structure, these active sites of the enzyme are partially blocked. And what that means is the activity of the enzyme when it's in the T state will be low. In contrast, in the R state, as a result of the loose conformation of the dimer structure, the active sites are actually open. And what that means is the R state is the fully active form of this enzyme. In the R state, the activity will be high, while in the T state, the activity will be low. Now, what's the difference between phosphorylase A and phosphorylase B? Well, phosphorylase A, the equilibrium of phosphorylase A exists predominantly on the R side, while the equilibrium for the phosphorylase B molecule exists predominantly in the T state. So what that means is, at equilibrium, we're going to have much more of the R state than the T state. On the other hand, for this particular case at equilibrium, we're going to have much more of the inactive T state than the active R state. Now, how do we go from phosphorylase B to phosphorylase A? Well, we have an enzyme known as phosphorylase kinase, which we'll discuss in just a moment. And what it does is, is it basically phosphorylates uh, specific serine amino acids on this glycogen phosphorylase. So remember, this is a dimer. We have two polypeptide chains. So one polypeptide chain and a second polypeptide chain. And the 14th amino acid position is a serine amino acid. So this one has a serine 14 and this one also has a serine 14. And phosphorylase kinase can use two ATP molecules to actually attach the phosphoryl groups on the two serine 14 molecules to basically form phosphorylase A. And that's what we mean by an interconvertible form. We can go from phosphorylase B to phosphorylase A by the activity of phosphorylase kinase, but this requires ATP molecules. Now, let's discuss when phosphorylase B predominates and when phosphorylase A actually predominates in our body. So let's discuss low energy charge conditions. Remember that energy charge, loosely speaking, is simply the ratio of ATP to AMP inside our cell. 
And so if we have low energy charge values within our skeleton muscle cells, we have a low ATP concentration relative to A and P. And what that means is our cells want to produce more ATP molecules. And so they want to break down glycogen into glucose to use the glucose via glycolysis to form ATP. And so what happens is when the cell contains a low level of ATP compared to A and P, the A and P adenosine monophosphate will actually act as an allosteric activator of phosphorylase B. It will bind to an allosteric side on phosphorylase B in the T state because the T state is the state that predominates for phosphorylase B and what it does is it basically shifts the equilibrium towards the R state. It opens up the active sites and that causes and increases the activity of this phosphorylase B. And so what that will do is it will stimulate the phosphorylase B to actually go on and break down the glycogen into glucose molecules to form more ATP. Now, in addition, sudden or strenuous activities such as, for instance, sprinting will basically stimulate the release of specific hormones, for instance, epinephrine. <clears throat> And what these hormones basically do is they stimulate the enzyme phosphorylase kinase. And remember, phosphorylase kinase uses ATP to transform the phosphorylase B, which exists predominantly in the inactive T state, into phosphorylase A, which exists predominantly in the R state. And what that does is it helps us produce more ATP molecules by breaking down glycogen into glucose and using the glucose in glycolysis to form those ATP. So when our cells are basically exercising, that means we have a low energy charge value. We want to produce more ATP because we have a low ATP relative to A and P concentration. The high A and P shifts the equilibrium of phosphorylase B to the R state, making it more active. And on top of that, we have the hormones that stimulate this enzyme to transform phosphorylase B into phosphorylase A, which automatically exists predominantly in the R state. And so we're going to break down glycogen much more readily into glucose to actually form ATP via glycolysis. Now, conversely, we can also have a high energy charge value. And what that means is we essentially have high ATP concentration relative to A and P. And so under these conditions, our cells don't need to and don't want to produce ATP. And the ATP will actually act as an allosteric inhibitor. It will compete with A and P and it will bind to the R state of phosphorylase B and shift the equilibrium back to the T state. In addition, when we have high ATP concentrations, that also implies we're going to have high glucose 6-phosphate concentrations. And so the glucose 6-phosphate will also act as an allosteric inhibitor to phosphorylase B and it will help shift the equilibrium of phosphorylase B towards the T state. So for the resting tissue, which basically means that's normal physiological conditions when we have a high energy charge, we have lots of ATP and lots of glucose 6-phosphate, and together they're going to act as allosteric inhibitors, basically shift the equilibrium of phosphorylase B from the R state back to the T state. And under these conditions, glycogen and breakdown inside the skeleton muscle tissue will basically not take place because we won't need to produce the ATP. So in the next lecture, we're going to focus on how the hepatocytes, the liver cells of our body, actually regulate glycogen breakdown by controlling this allosteric enzyme glycogen phosphorylase.